Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Holland. I am with South Arts. I'm the Director of Organization and Community Initiatives, and I'm super excited to have us joining uh, joining us today is Elaine Grogan Boutrell. And um, I, this is the second time Elaine has joined South Arts for this particular tax workshop. Um, and we learned so much information last year that we said we got to have her again this year because things change, as you know, from year to year in tax law. Um, I just want to give everyone a reminder that um, while Elaine is awesome and generous with her knowledge, that it's always best to work one-on-one -on -one for specific tax questions. So please don't take this information as tax advice. Uh, we will um, cover tips and things like that. And, and as I said, Elaine answers a lot of questions for you, but if you're needing specific tax advice, please reach out to a tax professional in your area who's familiar with your tax law. Um, I'm also going to really quick take this moment to thank the entities that make these um, <coughs> workshops possible. So that is the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, and our state partners. Um, so um, yay, we can give them some snaps or a round of applause, um, but they their funding does help make these programs available and um, free for all of you as well. So um, again, without any further ado, um, I am going to um, turn it over to Elaine to take you through the journey of taxes um, I know I get so excited about taxes. I'm probably kind of a dork that way, but, um, but Elaine, please. It's all Thank you. you so much, Jessica. Um, I, I am joining you with that excitement. Um, it is probably irrational, but, uh, it's, it's good to love what you do. Right. So, um, I will also add gratitude to South Arts, um, to, to the list of supporters and funders, uh, Jessica and the team do such incredible work and it is such a pleasure working with them. Um, and I am so appreciative that they make this information available and accessible to all. Uh, so I love seeing some familiar names in the participant list. Uh, if you were here last year, welcome back. Uh, there are some new changes we'll call out. You might already know some of the answers to some of the scenarios, um, and that is totally okay. Um, I love how liberally you are using the chat. Keep doing that. I will keep an eye on the chat as we go through everything. It's a good spot if you want to put comments or resources or questions. There's also a Q&A. So if you do have a specific question you'd like us to address as as we go through this information, the Q&A is a good spot to drop that as well. We'll try to kind of manage both as we go through this. Um, hopefully you can see my screen by now. Uh, that was the intent. Uh, and you know you are here for a tax workshop, so let's dive in. Our goal is to make navigating tax season a bit easier, not only for this tax season, but also into the future, which is why at the end we're going to talk about some planning strategies and, and things to think about going forward. More specifically, we are going to start by highlighting some 2024 changes. There's one that's especially technical, um, and I'm going to hit that right at the beginning. So apologies for diving into something technical right at the start, but I do want to make sure everyone has that information. We'll also go over the overall tax landscape. We'll spend a lot of time talking about ordinary and necessary deductions for creative individuals, and then we'll talk about records as well. As you know, my name is Elaine. I use she, her pronouns, and I am joining you from the very rainy and gray Dublin, Ohio today, just outside of Columbus. I'm on Kushkashkia and Hopewell Indigenous and Cultural Lands, and I run a financial education company called Minerva Financial Arts. Um, all of my work is with creative individuals, and that makes me pretty much the luckiest money person on the planet. As Jessica said, um, this information is being presented for educational purposes only and is not intended to be used as tax, legal, or accounting advice, but you probably knew that. So as I said, let's start with some of the new things for this year. And there are some sort of things that change every year. This year, uh, one of the big changes uh, is the retirement contribution limit. You still have until tax day to make contributions to your individual retirement account. That's your IRA. So the limit for a 2023 contribution to your IRA is $6,500. Or if you're over the age of 50, it is $7,500. If you've been doing doing IRAs for a minute, you know that the limit has been $6,000 for many a year. So this is a nice change. You've got a little bit more room if you want to make a smidge of an additional contribution. 
We also know the standard deduction amounts change every year. For 2023, if you are a single taxpayer, your standard deduction is $13,850. It's double that if you are married filing jointly. It's the same as that if you are married but filing separately from your spouse. And if you are head of household, meaning you are not legally married but you do have a dependent, your standard deduction for 2023 is $20,800. Remember, every taxpayer gets this standard deduction amount to reduce their taxable income. We also know the standard mileage rates change pretty much every year. For 2023, the rate for standard mileage deduction, so that's your business miles driven deduction, was 65 and a half cents per business mile driven. I've gone ahead and included the 2024 rate in here as well, in case you're thinking about planning or sending out contracts for 2024, the 24 rate is going to be 67 cents per business mile driven. So those are kind of the normal changes that we're used to every year. The two new especially fun changes that I want to draw your attention to relate to 1099Ks and FinCEN's BOI reporting requirement. So let's talk 1099Ks first. A 1099K is a special kind of 1099. You probably get lots of 1099s from all of your freelance work, but a 1099K comes from online payment apps. So if you are someone who accepts money for services or goods through Venmo or Cash App or any of the other sort of online payment apps, there was a rule, it has been delayed, but the new rule says those apps will send you a 1099K if the amount you collect on their apps exceeds a certain threshold. Now, originally, the threshold was going to be $600. That was the big change. Thanks to some advocacy work and lobbying, that rule has now been delayed twice. So we do not have a $600 limit for 1099Ks. That's a pretty low limit if you think about it. So we were expecting that lots of individuals would be getting these unexpected 1099Ks. The original threshold was $20,000 or more than 20 transactions, so or $20,000 from 20 or more transactions. So if you are selling through Venmo or Cash App at that level, you're going to get a 1099K. The $600 threshold has been paused at least another year. The IRS shared they're thinking about introducing a $5,000 limit for this year, meaning for 2024. All of which is to say... If you are someone who accepts payments through any online payment app, you're going to want to spend this year making sure you're sort of cleaning up that activity. Sometimes we will have personal transactions mixed in with business transactions, right? That's going to make your 1099 kind of a mess because you might get a 1099 that reports way more than just your business income, right? I don't want you to be in that situation. So since we've got another year to prepare for this, make sure you're kind of cleaning up your records. Maybe that means having a business Venmo and a personal Venmo, for example. And it probably means keeping all of your own records as well so that you have a really good sense of what income really is business income because your 1099K might be incorrect if there's personal stuff mixed in. And of course, a very loving and gentle, friendly reminder that even without a 1099K, if you are receiving income for goods or services through your business activity, that is still taxable income, which is another really good reason to keep excellent records for yourself. If you want to read more about this, the IRS has a great page on their website that goes into this in detail. So here's the second kind of intense technical update. Um, it has to do with FinCEN's BOI reporting requirement. And if that sounds like a lot of nonsense, I am right there with you because very few people have heard about this, although it's starting to come up more and more, which makes me happy because this is a big deal and this is something that needs to be on your radar. So let's start with some definitions. FinCEN stands for the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. That is a group, it's a division of the United States Treasury, and you might not have heard of it before this moment, which is totally fine. Most of their work relates to financial crimes, including anti-money laundering provisions. 
BOI stands for Beneficial Ownership Information. And FinCEN has confirmed that a beneficial owner for purpose of this new reporting requirement is someone who controls a company or owns 25% or more of that company. So what is this new requirement? All companies and businesses are required to report information to FinCEN, which is different from the IRS, right, on this very simple form that tells FinCEN who their beneficial owners are. It includes their names, it includes their addresses, and it probably includes a photograph of their driver's license or passport, right? So this is a new requirement. It started on January 1st of 2024, and the whole purpose is to help the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network understand who the humans are behind these different companies, right? It's anti-money laundering except it applies to everyone, including very small companies, which is great from an anti-money laundering perspective, but not so great from kind of just a, a compliance perspective, right? Because this is a new thing. You've got a year to comply with it, but it's going to be raising a lot of questions, including who is FinCEN and BOI and why is this coming up for me? This requirement applies to LLCs and corporations, but it does not generally apply to sole proprietors. So if you are sitting there saying, I'm a sole proprietor, do I have to do this? The answer is probably no. The one exception is if you were required to file anything with your secretary of state to establish your sole proprietorship. That is rare. Uh, it, it, it does happen, but that is more rare. So in general, this applies to LLCs, and many of you might have those, and corporations, including S corporations. FinCEN has confirmed that if you have an EIN through the IRS or if you're a sole proprietor doing business under a separate name, those things aren't enough to put you into the category of people who have to file this, which is good news. The frequently asked questions they have put together on this are really, really good, and they are updated pretty much every week or so now. So if this is something that is going to apply to you, and it probably will apply to quite a lot of you, go ahead and just check those FAQs on a pretty regular basis. If it applies to you, all you have to do is fill out a form. Now, it's a form that requires you to share your and any other owner information, including your home address. P.O. boxes are not allowed. And also provide probably a copy of your driver's license or passport, some sort of identifying information. The other thing about this is if there are any changes to that information. So a new owner in the company or more impactfully, if you move or you know the address of your business changes or, or something like that, those different informations or those changes will have to be updated to FinCEN within 30 days of that change happening, right? And if you are in the midst of a move, you not, might not be thinking about anti-money laundering regulations, right? So file this away and just see if you can kind of remember or put it on your annual tax checklist just to sort of stay compliant over time. You have until December 31st of this year to file this form if your business existed before January 1st of this year. So if you've had your LLC for a minute, you've got all the way until December 31st to file this, which is fantastic. If you form an entity during 2024, you have 90 days to file this form, right? Which is still, you know, some amount of time, but it's definitely something that you're going to want to be aware of. As I mentioned, the resources they have shared, including the FAQs, but also this small business resource are really, really helpful. Here's a di direct link to FinCEN's website if you want to learn more about this requirement. But... I suspect it will come up for you when you're filing your taxes this year. My hope is that your accountant will mention it to you or your attorney, perhaps, or if you're using tax software, there's a good chance that this is going to sort of show up as a question as part of the tax software. So be aware of it. Know that it is a requirement. It applies to you if you are an LLC or a corporation. 
And it's not a huge deal, right? Other than it's annoying. The other thing about it is that the fines and fees, if you do not comply, are substantial. They can be up to $500 per day of non-compliance, right? So that's a big number. That's everyone wants to take this very seriously, right? So don't sleep on this, right? You have until the end of the year. I'd probably give it another month or two as the dust settles since this is brand new, right? But go ahead and pay attention to this and, and make sure you get it done before the end of the year. There is no fee to complete this form. So it would not surprise me. In fact, we've already heard whispers of some scammers out there who are kind of sending these really intense letters and, you know, saying you are non-compliant and you have to pay them some amount of money to make you compliant. Don't fall for any of the scams, right? This is a free thing to do. You are probably able to do it yourself. It shouldn't take you more than about 10 minutes if you have a pretty straightforward company structure and your accountant and attorney can also probably give you some guidance as well. Don't pay someone to do this for you though. This is something you can do. Um, the information you are sharing, like your home address, right, and your driver's license will not be publicly available, thank goodness, but it is being contained and monitored by FinCEN and certain governmental officials and financial institutions may be able to access it under certain circumstances. In general, nonprofits are generally exempt from this requirement, which is also good news. So let's say you are a dancer and you teach and you do some freelance choreography work. All of that is for you as a sole proprietor. You probably don't have to file this form. You're a sole proprietor. And let's say you also run a dance nonprofit. Same thing. The dance nonprofit probably doesn't have to file this form, right? So, so that's some good news as well. But if you are an LLC or an S corporation, the odds are you're going to need to jump on this in the next couple of months to make sure it's done before the end of the year. I know that is a lot. Again, I apologize for starting with something so technical right at the beginning. You will continue to hear about this from a lot of different people throughout the year because there are a lot of different groups who are really trying to make sure that small businesses are aware of this. Um, I've been watching the chat. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jessica, for posting those links. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't see any questions about FinCEN or BOI. Um, I will pause for a second, though, just in case someone is typing something. All right. Since we don't see anything, I'm going to go on to... The big overarching question, how do federal income taxes work? Because that's what you're really here to hear about today. This is a general visual representation of what Form 1040 looks like in the United States. Form 1040 is the form individuals file if they are permanent residents, dual citizens, or U.S. citizens. If you fall outside of that category, uh, there is probably a different version of Form 1040 that you file if you have a filing requirement. But in general, the process is pretty straightforward, even though it does get very complicated in the details. The form starts with some human information about you and anyone else who's included on your tax return. Then it includes some income. Then we have some adjustments that generally reduce your income. We've got a standard deduction for everyone, or you can choose to itemize your deductions, and that gets you to your taxable income amount. And that's how we calculate the federal tax you owe. This is also the starting point for your state taxes, generally, if you have those, and also any local taxes you might owe. So as we're going through this, kind of the four big questions I want to make sure we answer um, are sort of what types of income do you have and, and why does that matter? Because we know in the arts, people generally earn income from a variety of different sources in a variety of different ways. So we want to make sure we're clear on where that goes on your tax form. We also want to answer sort of what's deductible for your business. What records do you need to keep to substantiate those deductions? And then how should you plan for taxes going forward? So let's start with that big income question. When you are listing out the different types of income you have, you may have income where you are treated as an employee. We call these wages or W-2 income. 
This is where you are an employee of someone else, that someone else pays you hourly or salaried, and they withhold taxes from what they are paying you. W-2 income is pretty straightforward, and it is also very different from business income you might have. Business income is income related to a business you are running, and you might get 1099s reporting some of that income to you. You also might track your own income through your own system. You also might get grants or awards or other types of income that kind of fall into this category where the income is related to a business you are running. So your wages live on the front of 1040, form 1040. Super easy, very straightforward. When you are paid by your employer, they are withholding taxes for federal, state, and local income tax purposes, but they're also withholding 7.65% of what they are paying you for Social Security and Medicare. Then they are also paying 7.65% from their own pocket to contribute to your Social Security and Medicare. You are splitting this obligation with them if you are an employee, which is a big deal. That is not true, by the way, if you are running a business. The other thing to know about W-2 income is that you are not allowed to claim any business deductions to offset your W-2 income. Why? Because if you are an employee of someone else, that someone else is the person who gets all the business deductions. You are the employee. You do not have any business deductions associated with your W-2 work. So make sure you're remembering that, especially if it feels like your self-employment or business is very similar to the W-2 work you do. You want to be really clear that any business deductions only relate to the business income you are generating, not to your W-2 income. But all that business income could come from Forms 1099. It could come from any grants or awards you might be getting. It could come from sales you are making through any number of sources, right? All of those other types of income you are collecting generally shows up here on Schedule C. That's where you report income from the business you are running. This is also where you report deductions to sort of offset or reduce that income. Remember, if you're an employee of someone else, no deductions. If you're running your own business though, you get ordinary and necessary business deductions to reduce your taxable income. As I mentioned, Schedule C is normally where you report that activity. That is true if you are a sole proprietor or if you are the only owner of an LLC, a limited liability company. If you have an LLC with other folks or you are an S corporation, your form is probably Schedule E instead of Schedule C, but all of the same general expenses are deductible. And if you are running your own business, Essentially, you are your own employee and your own employer. Not exactly. We don't always use those words, but in effect, that's what's happening. So your Social Security and Medicare taxes are 15.3%. Remember, if you're an employee of someone else, you are paying 7.65%. That's half of this amount. But if you are self-employed, you have to pay the entirety of that amount to account for both the individual and the business share of that. This is the tax that usually surprises people, right? Because it gets to be a really big number very quickly. So if folks run into tax trouble the first or second years they're running a business, this is usually where it is coming from. Orlando has a great question in the chat. Orlando says, do you pay taxes on a grant? The general answer, Orlando, is that yes, grants are taxable income, but that doesn't always mean you pay taxes on it. And I know that's a really annoying answer to give, right? So let's pretend, Orlando, you receive a $5,000 grant and you report that $5,000 grant as income on your Schedule C because it is related to the creative business you are running. 
Now, maybe you spend the entirety of that grant. Maybe you spend $4,000 on supplies and $1,000 on um, uh, uh, promoting an event you are hosting. So like advertising or something like that. In that case, you would have $5,000 of grant income. You would have $1,000 of an advertising expense, which is deductible, and you would have $4,000 of supplies, which would be deductible. So you would have $5,000 of income and $5,000 of expenses. So that puts you in a position where your net income is zero. That's the amount you pay taxes on, but you still have that taxable income you're reporting. You just don't end up paying taxes on it. But let's flip it around a little bit. Let's say you get that $5,000 grant, you spend $2,500 on it, um, on like a new computer you're gonna buy, a new piece of equipment for your business. And then you pay yourself an honorarium for the rest, right? In that case, you have $5,000 of grant income. You have a $2,500 expense for the computer that you're gonna use completely for business purposes. That means from your business, you have net income of $2,500. That's the part you would pay taxes on. And it would be calculated at that 15.3% self-employment rate. I hope that helps, Orlando. Uh, let me know if you have any follow-ups in the chat. Talisha asks in the chat, um, if you are both employed and running a business, do you still have to pay 15.3%? Yes, you do. Because... We want to pay Social Security and Medicare on all the income you're earning, right? So if you're earning some from as an employee, you're paying it over here. And then from your own business, we want to make sure you're also paying it on those earnings as well. And when you go through TurboTax, um, Kay, I think this is your question, or any other tax filing software you're doing, yes, it will automatically calculate this for you. And in fact, if you want to look back to last year's return, the extra schedule that will show up is called Schedule SE, and that's where it calculates that self-employment tax. But remember, this is only on business income, right? So if you are reporting income, not as business income, maybe as hobby income, hobby income is not subject to that self-employment tax but you also don't get any of your deductions. I would argue that if you are actively running a business, the correct way to report it is as business income. Sierra says, if you use all the grant money, do you still owe taxes? No, if you collect all the money and spend it all on ordinary and necessary business expenses, you will not end up paying anything in taxes. You may still have to report it all on your tax form though. Um, and Sierra, quick follow-up, the same is true for crowdfunded projects or donations as well. Um, just make sure you watch for that timing. So let's say Sierra, in December, you start a crowdfunding campaign and you collect $10,000 for a production you are going to launch in March of the next year. In that case, what would happen is you would have $10,000 of income in one tax year, but you would only have the expenses to reduce that income in the next tax year. It'll all shake out at the end, but that's going to cause you some problems because you have to pay the taxes first before you essentially get them refunded. So watch for the timing on those crowdfunding projects. I hope that helped. Um, Milan asks, will this video be sent to you? Yes, um, that style arts is amazing about sharing all the resources. So yes, this, this will come to you. And Emily asks, if you file at a loss or net zero for business income, then what? Is it better to file as a hobby? And then Emily continues, for example, I received a couple grants last year and sold some work, but I haven't been able to pay myself from any of that. I would say, Emily, um, if it feels like you're regularly conducting the activity with the intention of making money from it, then I would say that to me rises to the level of being a business. Um, but you are the one in the best position to know if it's sort of like an occasional thing you're doing um, or not. If you file as a hobby, there are no deductions, right? So then you would be reporting the entirety of the income with no deductions. You don't pay self-employment tax, but you do pay federal, state, and local tax on that income. Whereas in a business tax world, you 
get the deductions, and then taxes imposed on the net amount. So I would say if you are regularly carrying on an activity with the intention of making money from it, even if you haven't made a lot yet, I would say that still rises to the level of business. Hope that helps. Um, Keith has a question in the Q&A. Keith says, what if the grant is a multiple year grant to be divided over a three year period? Do you pay the taxes at one time or over the three years? Keith, it depends on when you get the money. So some grants will let you specify when you want to be paid. Um, I know the Pew Center out of Philadelphia allows you to spread the grant you are receiving over one, two, or three years. So if you are if you are able to specify when you get the money, then you would pay the taxes in the year you got the money, minus any deductions you had. Um, if the grant does not allow you to spread it over time, if they award the grant and they give it to you all in the first year, uh, and then you're just supposed to spread it over those multiple years yourself, uh, then you would pay it all at once. I hope that answers, Keith. Um, great question. Um, follow up if I, if I missed something on that. Um, there is a great question from Leandra. What if you pay other artists out of the grant? Leandra, I'm going to come back to that one because I have an example with that. And then I'm going to look to you, Leandra, to make a guess in the chat when the time is right. Um, and then Wendy says, Wendy built a studio and added a new kiln. Um, and Wendy is asking if the studio and the kiln all in cost around $35,000 would qualify as a business expense. My guess is probably Wendy. Um, although let's come back to that one as well, because you might have a depreciation challenge, not challenge. You might have a depreciation option you might want to think about. Um, and then Shannon has a question about inventory. I'm going to come back to that one as well, Shannon. Um, and then Sherry says, can an awarded residency, which lists housing as free, still list the fair market value on your W-2? Sherry, generally not. Um, if they are giving you a benefit, um, generally they don't include that benefit as taxable income to you on a W-2. Um, there might be some nuances or exceptions in there. Um, and I've seen some organizations provide it kind of on a separate statement. So they'll say, you know, here's your salary, here's what you got in retirement contributions, here's the parking benefit, right? So they'll list all the other benefits you got. But when it comes to actually reporting your taxable income, um, it doesn't necessarily include a lot of those other benefits. Um, so that that could be maybe what's going on too. Such good questions. Keep them coming. This question kind of connects to what Emily was asking, right? This idea about, are you running a business, right? Because we know there's a distinction between business income and then employee income. So whether or not you're running a business becomes a pretty important question. So when we're aiming to answer that question, one of the first things we look at is whether you approach the activity professionally and you keep books and records. Because keeping books and records, which just means keeping track of things basically, is a really good indicator that you are pursuing something professionally instead of doing it just for fun. If you are doing something just for fun, Generally, we don't keep books and records, although there are exceptions. So keeping books and records is a really good indicator that you are, in fact, approaching an activity professionally with the intention of making money from it. So when we're talking about books and records, what we really mean, and the IRS has said, is you can use any system suited to your needs as long as it tracks income and expenses, right? Because that's essentially what we're looking for. We're looking for the amount of money coming in and then the amount of money going out during a period of time. Those are your books and records for accounting or financial purposes. I will say, because you can use any system, I would encourage you to sort of reflect on what system is best for you, not only knowing kind of the way you work and how you like to work, but also knowing kind of where your business is because you can spend very little or even no money on a system, and you can spend a lot of money on a system. So it makes sense to kind of reflect on what would serve you best as you're making this choice. 
And Kate asks, what systems do I recommend? Kate, I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, I have a couple I recommend, but as you're looking at different ones, make sure the system is capturing the date of every transaction, the counterparty, so who did you pay or who paid you, the amount of every transaction, and the business purpose. These are kind of the four key pieces of information you're going to want to retain or keep or track in your system. And you'll notice these first three, you can get from a receipt or a credit card statement, right? These first three pieces of information are pretty easy to gather. It's this business purpose that you generally have to proactively supply or type in or document in some sort of way. So your first option for a system is a database system. I'm talking like Google Sheets or Excel. I love a database system, Kate. I think it gives you a whole lot of flexibility. These are really powerful tools. You probably already have access to them. Um, Google Sheets is free and Excel is available um, if, you, if you have the Microsoft suite. Um, Numbers is the Mac version of Excel as well. It's not quite as powerful, but it still gets the job done. I really love a good database system. I think there are a lot of good reasons and pros to using it. If you hate Excel, though, or you hate Google Sheets, or this is not something that works for you, there are some other good options as well. If you're using a database system, the way I would set it up is I would just export data from your bank account and then use that to sort of get organized. Um, I would also make sure you're adding categories and that business purpose. And this is basically how I would set this up. Um, you obviously have all the key information that you're required to have by the IRS. And then I would add a category column that allows you to basically track different expenses and kind of put them into categories of things that feel similar. When you do that, then you can get sort of a higher level kind of understanding of your business. Um, I would also make sure that this category kind of matches up with where you're gonna put the information on your tax form. That'll save you some time year after year. Kristen says Notability is a really good option. Um, that's a great system. Thanks for sharing that recommendation, Kristen. Um, the other thing you might want to add to Excel or Google Sheet is some sort of mileage log. Uh, this is a very analog version of a mileage log where you are just typing in the date business miles driven, and then the business purpose. And then it is calculating essentially the tax deduction for you here. This is another thing that you can sort of stay on top of throughout the year. Um, if you don't want to do it analog style, there's an app called Mile IQ that is fantastic for tracking business miles driven. Um, it is a really great option. Just make sure annually or so you are exporting the data from Mile IQ in case the app is no longer supported while your tax return could still be audited. QuickBooks also has an app that allows you to track mileage. And QuickBooks is fantastic for sort of tracking income and expenses for your business. It is also particularly good if you are hiring employees um, or something like that. Oh, yeah. And uh, Shady Kimsey notes in the chat that in order to use MileIQ or any mileage tracking one, um, yeah, you have to have location services enabled. Um, if you are not comfortable with that, may I suggest Excel or Google Sheets is a really good option that does not involve tracking your location at all times. So QuickBooks uh, is sort of the classic small business accounting software. Uh, Zero is another version of that. FreshBooks uh, has a lot of the same functionality and it has a really wonderful invoicing feature. And then Wave um, is really wonderful in that it has a free version, which is not true of QuickBooks, and it also has a paid version. Wave does all of the same things that QuickBooks does, more or less, in that Instead of you kind of organizing everything, it will automatically import data from your bank account. Again, you have to give it access to do that. So if you're uncomfortable with that, there's an analog way you can follow, right? But it will import the data 
And then you can tell it what categories things go in, or it will start to learn those patterns and habits over time. And so some of the organizing of the data will become more automated. You still always have to review it. It's never going to be perfect, but any of these systems takes some of the manual data entry part out of the process if you want to automate it more. Um, and there are versions available that are free and that are more expensive. Um, QuickBooks has a self-employed version and then a small business version. The difference is around $6 a month. I think small business is around 35 after you get through all sort of the intro promo pricing. Um, and I think self-employed is around $29 a month. That tends to be one of the more expensive ones. Um, the other one that increasingly I'm seeing people use right now is called Simplify. Um, this used to be Quicken, but then it was purchased by another company and now it is Simplify. Um, it's pretty good. And I see a lot of people using it if they want to track personal income and expenses, and then also business income and expenses kind of in the same world. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility if you want to do that. Also, uh, if you were a Mint user, um, you have probably heard or been told by Mint, if you are still reading their emails, um, that Mint has gone away. It's morphed into Credit Karma and they are no longer doing sort of income and expense tracking through Mint. Um, so if that was a system you were using, you might be you might be exploring a new one. Claire, I'm so sorry to be the bearer of bad news on that. Um, so, so yeah, you could probably still get your old data from Mint, um, but they are no longer supporting it and sort of showing where your, your income and expenses are going from. Okay, um, so Gay, uh, Gaia, I apologize, Gaia, I have horribly, horribly mispronounced your name. Um, Gaia says, if I work at home in your studio and then drive to the classroom studio, can I claim that mileage? I doubt it, and here's why. I bet your classroom studio is somewhere where you are paid as a W-2 employee. So remember, if you are a W-2 employee, mileage is not deductible. In fact, you have no business deductions. So my guess is because it's a classroom studio, you are an employee of someone else. Now, if you are not an employee, let's pretend you are hired one time to lead a workshop at a community center and you drive to the community center to lead the place. In that case, I would feel more comfortable with the, the business miles driven there because you are no longer an employee. It is related to your self-employed creative business. Talisha has a great question. Um, Talisha says, can you give an example of what we would put in the business purpose column? Would it be something like used for email campaigns for MailChimp? Exactly, Talisha. Um, it would be, you know, a subscription to MailChimp for monthly email marketing, or it would be a payment to landlord for studio rental space, or it would be a purchase of supplies to create XYZ body of work or something like that. Um, so any sort of human word description okay. of what you bought so that you're basically explaining Lord. in regular human words what the Hello. business purpose of the transaction you. is. All right, how about you? Instead of yeah. Jessica, do you yeah. mind seeing if we could mute, yeah. mute folks? Yeah, um, no, no, and no. folks, if you don't mind just double checking to make sure you're muted, uh, that would be awesome. Um, and I, I'm glad everyone is doing so well. Um, so the business purpose is basically you explaining why it's not a personal expense, right? Because remember, personal expenses are not deductible. So that's why we want to sort of explain why it's a business expense, why it's related to your business, because then it could be deductible. Okay, Susanna says, um, has a question on sort of timing um, for a production deposit. Um, Susanna, I'm going to come back to that question because um, I, do, I don't know that you can sort of get around that. You could sort of prepay some expenses. Um, that might be sort of your best option. Joanne mentioned Mint. Sorry about Mint. Um, uh, Becca says Wave seems to work really well. Yep, totally. Um, Susan says, which of these softwares allow for classes? 
they all do, but they all call them something different, right? So, you know, within each system, you can subdivide by columns or groups. That's how I kind of think about it. So, so by classes or by fun type, or you can sort of slice a little bit different. Kay says, do you have to show business purpose instead of just general shipping, for example? I mean, yeah, you're supposed to track that information, Kay. Um, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. Um, but yeah, you are supposed to sort of note why it's a business expense instead of instead of something else. Um, but, you know, shipping is probably okay, right? Shipping of work, maybe shipping of supplies, right? I think I think you're probably okay. Um, Lucretia says, for a grant that was received to you, the human, and not the LLC, can you designate it as income for your LLC? Um, probably. Um, I'm assuming you're the only owner of the LLC, uh, but my guess is yes. Um, and then it might slightly complicate tax reporting, but it probably should be okay. Um, and since you probably have a separate bank account for the LLC, I would go ahead and, and move the money in there just for cash flow, cash flow purposes. And Freya says, does it ever make sense to not claim deductions on taxes? I mean, generally, we would like everything to be reported accurately and completely. But I think sometimes there are situations where you might want to show slightly higher income. So you might be a little bit less aggressive in reporting all of your deductions where there's sort of judgment room. Um, that would be in situations where you're maybe wanting to demonstrate higher net income or net income that is sort of on the higher side rather than the, the, uh, the lower side. Obviously you'll pay more taxes on that, um, but there, there might be reasons why that makes sense for you. Maybe you are um, yeah, seeking funding for something, or maybe you are um, applying for you know, different loans where they're examining sort of your income and expenses over the past couple of years. Um, obviously we're not gonna do fraud, right? We're not gonna sort of intentionally misstate things, but where there's, room for judgment, uh, your judgment might be a little more com um, conservative or a little more aggressive, um, depending on kind of overall goals. Um, and Keith has another question. Thanks for this again, Keith. How does one account for scholarships that have specific purposes like a conference or travel scholarship? Great question, Keith. You're using the word scholarship, so I wanna be careful. If you receive a scholarship, for something that is related to a degree you are pursuing. A scholarship is not generally taxable income, but generally expenses you have for pursuing that degree are not deductible expenses either. But if you are working in your field and the scholarship you're receiving is from, say, a conference that wants you to attend and they are giving you a $500 travel scholarship or something, but you are not in pursuit of a degree, that would count as income and then you would have the $500 of expenses to kind of offset that scholarship. I hope that's helpful. Such great questions. Keep them coming. I absolutely love it. And we've fast forwarded too many times. Here's the pro tip. I would suggest you set up a little bit of time on a regular basis to kind of stay on top of these records. Um, I love monthly just because it feels like a nice rhythm, but that doesn't work for everyone. Sometimes quarterly makes more sense for your business. Um, and there was a wonderful touring musician I worked with last year who just said, I'll do it at the end of every tour. And I was like, that's fantastic, right? She's not gonna do it when she's on the road. It doesn't make any sense, right? But at the end of a tour, a usually six to eight week period, she would set aside one day and then sort of catch up on all the records from that period. That's a perfectly fine way to do it. Just do it sort of regularly with some sort of rhythm throughout the year so that it doesn't sort of add up too much at the end. There's one more question from Claire. As an individual freelancer, Claire uses personal cards on expenses. So aside from removing the need to sort through business versus personal, is it important to have a completely separate card or bank account? Yes and no, Claire. I love it just from the ease of keeping things separate, right? It makes it a little bit easier to track things as you pointed out, right? That's why we say it's, it's really helpful, right? 
But unless you are an LLC, where from a liability perspective, I want to make sure there is that separation. Unless you're an LLC or an S corporation, no. If you were at a point where it's just easier to kind of keep it all together, that's okay. It just means you might need a little bit more time to spend record keeping as part of that, um, which is not the end of the world, uh, especially if that works best for you. I don't think you have to sort of lose sleep over separating it if that doesn't make sense for you at this point. So that's our books and records conversation, right? Um, we know that keeping books and records is a good indicator that you are in fact running a business. The other indicators we look for are, do you spend enough time on the activity to make it profitable? What we're looking for here is, is this something that you are doing on a regular basis or is it like a one-time thing, right? There's a big range between regular basis and one-time thing. So it's a little bit of a gut check about whether you are regularly carrying on the business. We also want to know if you have the knowledge needed to make the business successful or you seek out that knowledge or support from others. And last of all, it's always good if you are making money from the activity. It's not always possible to make more than your expenses from the activity, but the IRS likes to see if you are running a business that you have positive net income from that business. In fact, if you have positive net income for three out of every five years, they will assume you are running a business. Now, that might not always be true for every type of business, especially if you had a year with a $35,000 expense for a new kiln, for example, right? So what we would want to do if you cannot show positive net income for three out of five years is we would want to make sure you can demonstrate these other things, right? Because this is a rebuttable presumption from the IRS, which means that you can provide evidence that you are in fact running a business, even if it has not been profitable for three out of every five years. And of course, if you are a business, you get business expenses. And this kind of relates a little bit, maybe with a stretch to Adam's question. Adam says, does the separate bank account need to necessarily be a business account if you are an LLC, or can it be a separate account under your personal name at the bank? Great question, Adam. If you're an LLC, the account needs to be in the LLC's name, which means the bank or financial institution will treat it as a business account. Um, otherwise, it will be treated as a personal account, which is totally fine, except that from a liability perspective, the whole point of having the LLC is to keep personal and business separate to protect your personal assets from business wrongdoing. So if we're sort of co-mingling things, you're voluntarily giving up some of that liability protection, which I don't love. I'd like you to keep the liability protection. So those business expenses, and we've talked about a couple of them already, which I absolutely love. And the general rule is that business expenses are deductible if they are ordinary, necessary, and effectively connected to your trade or business. That effectively connected piece comes up in that business purpose description, right? Ordinary, according to the IRS, means common and accepted in your industry. Necessary means helpful and appropriate for your trade or business. So you can see there's a lot of judgment embedded in these decisions about whether something is ordinary and necessary. There are also some special tax rules, and we'll talk about some of those. But this is the section on Schedule C that lists all the expense categories, right? And I will tell you, these categories apply to every type of business that exists in the United States. These are not specific to artists or designers or writers or performers, which means you probably will have a lot of expenses in categories you define. You can list them here in part five and just specify the category and then the amount that falls in that category. You'd want to do that if your expenses don't really fit well in some of these other categories. 
Now, some of them will fit well. If you're paying to promote ads uh, or posts online, that's pretty clearly advertising. If you are travel, travel makes sense here, but maybe you uh, have professional development or you are taking classes to continue your level of creative expertise. That's something that doesn't really fit well in another category. So you might have professional development as a category here in part five. But as you're tracking things within your system, and as you're sort of grouping things into these categories that make sense, that's where we then say, okay, do these categories match with what shows up on the tax form? It's nice if they do. If they don't, maybe then that's when we sort of define our own categories in part five. And I would say, just as a general rule, track everything that's related to your business in your system. At the end of the year, you can figure out what's deductible or what the limitations are and, and sort of all of that nuance. But you want to go ahead and track everything so that you or your tax preparer or anyone else can have the information they need to make informed decisions at the end of the year. And then, as I mentioned, I love the idea of creating like some sort of map that shows where your categories end up on Schedule C. So let's say I gave the example of, you know, boosting some posts online. Let's say you're going to have an event um, and you put $150 into boosted posts on social media over like four transactions. In your system, that would show up as four different transactions for whatever amounts they are. And the category might be boosted posts. You could call it advertising, right? You could call it marketing. Within your system, you can call it whatever category makes sense with your brain. And then on your little map, you would say, okay, boosted posts, that goes into line eight advertising on my Schedule C. And when you've got that little map, then it makes it much easier year after year when you're opening up that tax software or sending everything to your accountant, it makes it easier just to kind of remember where things have gone over time. Marissa, I see your question. I'm going to come back to it in the Q&A. I will also say the instructions to Schedule C are pretty good at sort of describing what they mean in those different categories. And then Publication 583 from the IRS has a really good description of these record keeping requirements. Okay, so now we get to the examples and the, the stories about what's deductible. So if you haven't already been active in the chat, uh, now is the time to do so. Here's our first example. Um, this particular artist drove 10 miles to and from a gig, and they spent $25 on gas during the trip. They paid $5.50 to park for the gig while they were there, and they were having some sort of great conversation or something was going on, and they ended up getting a parking ticket. The big question is, what is deductible on Schedule C? Put your answers in the chat. Nick says, not the ticket. Ellen says, the mileage. Becca says, $30.50. Oh, bonus points for doing the math, Becca. Nice job. Soraya says, mileage, gas, mileage, gas, not the ticket. Oh, you're so good. You're so good. Correct. Your parking is deductible. Mileage is deductible at the IRS rate, right? And if you're going to take the IRS rate, you cannot take gas, right? So you either take the standard deduction or you take a percent overall of your gas. General rule is that standard deduction really does well, right? In that uh, the standard deduction for mileage tends to be more than enough to cover wear and tear on your car and gas and insurance, unless you have some crazy expensive car, right? But I would take the parking. I would do the mileage at the IRS rate. Um, I would not do the gas because as Lashana says, you can't double dip. Nice job, Lashana. Um, and then uh, the ticket is not deductible. Apologies. Um, you might still decide it is totally worth it. And I am completely fine with you making that choice, but you cannot deduct it. Uh, Keith says, what if the musician had to buy a meal during the performance? Would that be included? I would say yes, especially if the musician is dining with others. And then I would describe it as meal during gig with bandmates to talk about set list or something like that, right? There has to be a business purpose associated with that meal. And I would be pretty clear about uh, deducting it or, or documenting it. 
Soraya says, do you pick either mileage or gas, not both, or is only mileage acceptable? So it's an either or, but I'm going to say but here. If you don't use the mileage rate, then you have to track all of your car expenses during the year. So this gas and all the other gas, right? And then you have to take a percentage of the total vehicle costs based on the percentage of business use versus um, uh, personal use, right? Because personal use, not deductible. Business use is deductible. So you could do the gas, but only if you're doing it for the entirety of all car expenses for the year. I hope that makes sense, Soraya. Kay is asking a follow-up um, about the meal, Keith's question. Keith got right to the heart of the nuance there, which I love. Um, and Kay says, not just feeding yourself alone during the gig or at an art show. I think you would, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to deduct that meal, eating by yourself alone at a gig or at a show, especially if it is somewhere away from your tax home, right? The city where you live and do business. Um, I think it gets a little dicier if on your way to a gig, you pick up some fast food, right? Um, versus like actually at the gig. I don't want to sort of split hairs too, too much here, um, because if you are away for a period of time and you have to eat, yeah, I think that's probably fine. I think it is a stronger deduction in terms of business purpose if there are others with you as well. I think it's harder to deduct individual meals unless you are away from home. I hope that helps, Kay. Ah, Christopher, such a good question, says musicians are paid in cash with no note W-2. How is that handled? Christopher, all that is taxable income and it is up to the musician to track and report it. Now, we know that, you know, perhaps not every dollar gets reported, right? But it is up to the individual to track their taxable income, report it, and then report any deductions used to generate that taxable income? Great question. Wendy says mileage back home is deductible. I would say yes, you know, to and from, I feel comfortable deducting that mileage. Um, and Talisha, Talisha, you have led me really beautiful into the next example. Uh, Talisha says, um, Talisha is a writer um, going to conference out of state. Are flights and transportation deductible? So um, let's pretend this example says a visual artist was invited uh, to participate in something out of state. Uh, they paid $4.95 for flights. They checked their luggage. They paid $45 to upgrade their seat on the plane. And then they had lodging three nights for the business purpose reason, and then one extra night uh, to see a friend. Um, the question is, what is deductible on Schedule C? Shannon says everything but the extra night and the upgrade. Kay says not the upgrade. Flight and luggage check and two nights at the hotel, says Claire. Yeah, I would be comfortable doing the upgrade. That $45 doesn't really bother me. I think that is generally deductible. You are all are maybe a little more stingy than I am on the upgrade. Um, because this basically just means you get on the plane and you can stash your bag, right? So so I'm okay with that. And you all hit it perfectly. Lodging while you're there for the business purpose is deductible, but probably not the extra night that is uh for personal purposes. When we're looking at travel, and Trecha, this might get back to your question as well, we look to the primary purpose of the trip. If the primary purpose is business related, then you're on solid ground to deduct getting to and from the location and then uh, lodging and generally meals also while you are there, right? So, you know, primary purpose, business related, you're good. If there is a personal piece, we usually carve that out and don't deduct it. But if the primary purpose of the trip is personal, then it would be much harder to deduct your flight um, and lodging, right? Because um, the primary purpose of the trip is personal. Wendy says, would residency travel be deductible? I would say probably yes. If you're in the business of being an artist and a residency is part of that, that feels good. 
Siobhan says, are miles deductible for travel to and from the art gallery? I would say yes. Um, that feels really good. Um, and then there was a question, oh, from Leandra. Yes. Um, Leandra, going back to the meals, said, do you have to pay for the other people for it to be more viable? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, you certainly can. That would be a lovely thing for you to do. Um, but no, paying for the others doesn't make it more viable. But documenting that business purpose when there are others involved really helps uh, for sure. And then Soraya has a question that says, maybe off topic, which are my favorite kind of questions. If you drive for Uber Eats, is it possible to deduct car insurance and repairs? Um, I'm assuming you're not in California um, and you are treated as a contractor for Uber Eats. And so that contract income is related to kind of a separate business you are running as a freelancer for Uber Eats. And so then the percentage mileage uh, for insurance and car repairs, right? You would you could do the sort of overall car costs for the year and then divide divide those costs by business for your creative business, business for Uber Eats, and then personal, um, and then take that deduction. That does feel like a separate business than your art business though. So you would probably have two different schedule Cs. Great question. David flies to Denmark every summer and has a home there, but also has a gallery there and paints there. Can David write off the trip? David, I would say it depends on the primary purpose of the trip. If the primary purpose is because you as a human summer in Denmark, no, doesn't feel deductible. But if the primary purpose is you have an opening at your gallery and you're going to Denmark for the opening, that starts to feel a little more deductible to me. I will tell you though, if you've been summering in Denmark your entire life and only now we're calling it business purpose, that's gonna probably feel suspicious and raise some red flags. I like you think I like the way you think though. Sprad said um, earned a profit this year to maintain a business status. I love that. Um, continuing to paint, uh, Sprad did not make any sales. How do you handle this? Basically a year off. Um, Great question. I would say um, kind of a couple different ways to handle it. Um, you could, and maybe consult with your tax person on this, um, you could file essentially a zero Schedule C that basically just says something to the effect of, you know, pause the business for a year. Um, if you continued to have expenses and you want to document those, um, I think you could report them and then show a loss for the year. But as you said, you're you're cognizant of you know the activity being shown to be not regularly carried on, which would disallow those business expenses. Great question, and I'm I'm sorry for the caregiving work you've been doing. Um, I know that's a that's a heavy load. Um, Leandra says, uh, for someone with a W-2 job, an LLC, and a sole proprietor, do you have a 1040 and two Schedule Cs? You do, Leandra. Congratulations. 1040 and two Schedule Cs. And remember, the Schedule Cs get attached to the 1040, so all that income ends up showing up on the front of the 1040. Ooh, CJ, you have one of my favorite questions. Uh, CJ donates services to a nonprofit and says, can I deduct the value of the performance workshop, et cetera, on your taxes? Such a good question, CJ. I'm so glad you are freely giving of your talents and expertise, but that is not a tax deduction. I'm very sorry. If you have any supplies that you use during the performance or the workshop, um, then those supplies would be deductible. Um, probably, I'm imagining that what you're doing is helping to advertise your work or promote yourself. You know, it's it's related to sort of your creativity somehow. Um, so supplies, I would feel good about deducting. Mileage to and from, yeah, business expense, basically. Um, but no, you cannot deduct the value of services you provide. Um, similarly, if I, CJ, volunteered to do your tax return for free, that would be very nice of me, but I would not be able to then deduct my pro bono services for you because services generally are not deductible. Uh, Wendy is both an artist and a filmmaker, both sole proprietors and freelance. So how do you declare? Um, 
I would say, Wendy, if it feels like they're two separate activities, you probably have two separate schedule C's. And in filmmaking world, it's pretty common to keep the film costs separate, um, especially if you end up getting investors for the film long term or something like that. Um, or in your world, Wendy, if you think about it and and it's pretty closely related, right? If you feel like it's not necessarily a separate film. It's sort of all under you as an artist. If it feels like it's one business or one activity, you would probably have one Schedule C. Great question. Um, Susanna says, is travel for research and development deductible? I would say yes, but be careful. Make sure that it is, in fact, legitimate research. Um, I'll share a story. One of my favorite writers uh, had season tickets to the Yankees, which might be controversial in this group, but they are an amazing baseball team. And he always dreamed about writing a play about the Yankees. And his question was, could I travel to see the Yankees and deduct my season tickets as research? The answer is no, right? Because that feels really aspirational from a research perspective. Here's how it could feel more legitimate. If someone has commissioned him to write something about the Yankees, if it's not season tickets, but maybe tickets to like a couple of games, if it is like a new expense rather than something he's been doing his whole life, kind of like the Denmark submarine example from earlier, right? All of that makes the research feel like more legitimate research as opposed to, I'd love to go to Bali. Maybe I'll do some research there, right? So, so that's kind of what we're looking for. Is it is it legitimate research? And if it is legitimate research and the primary purpose of that trip is research, it's not just you're going to take an extra day to reflect after your family vacation, right? Then I would say you're on pretty solid ground. But it is also something that will probably attract scrutiny. So you want to make sure you're documenting everything really clearly. So how are you documenting that research? Um, is it field notes you're taking? Or is it meetings you're having with different gallerists because you want to break into a new geographical market? Or um, are you taking photographs as reference that then show up in a body of work that you are going to display the next year, right? The clearer line we can draw between the research and the income, the more solid the deduction. I hope that's helpful. Um, uh, can you make donations, Athleta says, for artwork? Yes, but only the cost of the piece, not the fair value. Apologies. Um, Soraya is a DJ. Oh, this is going back to the meals thing. Um, you know, I would say you're probably okay. Um, I think it's stronger if it's in, if it's with other people. I think it's harder if it's just by yourself, right? Um, Cause it starts to feel like a personal meal cause humans have to eat, right? So just because humans have to eat doesn't make it deductible. So we would look to some sort of stronger purpose to make the meal deductible, right? Because regular human consumption of food is personal. What's the business purpose to make it deductible? I don't know if that helps explain it a little more. Um, I wish there were just like an absolute rule I could give you, um, but a lot of this stuff is, is more nuanced than that. Um, yeah, for sure. Oh, Marissa asked about donations. Yes, but only at cost, right? Services, not deductible. Donations of physical work, deductible at cost, not fair value. Um, do, 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 do. Cost and fair value. Kelly says, what's the difference? Okay, so Kelly, let's pretend I am a painter and I buy $35 worth of supplies, paint, canvas, squash, whatever, to put into a painting, right? The cost of the painting to me is then $35, right? That's the um, amount I have spent on the materials that go into it. Fair value is what someone would buy it for because realistically, nobody's buying my painting because of the $35 of paint. They're buying it because of my hand, of my conception of it, of sort of all of the value I, the human, put onto the work, right? So the fair value of that piece might be $8,500 and I had $35 worth of cost. Cost is sort of the direct cost of the things that go into it, not counting your own time. And fair value is what someone else not related to you is willing to pay for it. Hope that helps.
And Brittany just asked the question, can you count the hours you spent as a cost? No, you sure can't. That goes back to like the service is not sort of a cost or deduction piece. And Shannon says, is inventory value then the fair value of materials or the cost of materials? Generally, Shannon, if you are tracking your inventory, you are tracking it at cost, not at fair value. If you're looking for replacement costs, though, or like insurance costs, um, I'd rather it be closer to fair value because that represents the loss. But realistically, it's it's probably going to be just the cost that you can substantiate. Uh, Cindy says, can you claim the cost of a class or training related to your business? Yes, absolutely. Nice question. Um, here's a meals example. I think we've sort of hit this a little bit, but I want, I want to sort of say it one more time. Um, this person is out of town for a training program and they spent $400 on meals. Those meals are deductible, right? While you're in travel status, individual meals, totally deductible, right? You are away from your tax home, which means, right, you are away for the purpose that is business related. You have to eat while you're away, that's deductible. You will note meals are only 50% deductible, right? But that's okay, right? We still take the deductions we are entitled to. And then this is the example that's maybe a little bit closer to what we would watch out for if you're around your own town sort of having a meal. If you're too tired to cook and you spend some money bringing in some food to eat in your studio while you work, that does not feel tax deductible to me, right? So that is just a human consuming food. So that's kind of what we're watching for. What is the business purpose of the meal? And then, as I noted, uh, there is that 50% limitation on meals. Here's another meal example. This person bought lunch for their agent. It should really be the other way around, but this person can deduct $75 of that lunch. Uh, Talisha says, do you put in the total amount of the meals on the form or does the software handle it? It depends on the software. In my experience, you usually put in the total amount and then they will take half of it. Um, but when you're doing that final review with the software, instead of just saying like, yeah, they probably got it. Just that's one I would double check just to make sure. Uh, great question. Uh, Brittany uh, and CJ have the question about books that you buy for research or to help your business practices. That feels like a pretty solid deduction to me. Um, I think there, there could be areas where you abuse it. So I would be careful about the abuse, but absolutely books for your practice or research, um, those types of materials. Someone asked about going to an art gallery earlier. All of that does feel like research, right? I think it starts to become more aggressive when it is every book you buy. I recognize you might take creative inspiration from everything, but it starts to feel a little aggressive if it is every book you buy you'd want to sort of strengthen the business purpose and connect the research to something you're working on in my dream scenario. Um, it also starts to be more aggressive if the research is, you know, in a really delightful place and it starts to feel like a vacation of sorts. So, so that's what we would sort of watch for in research. But if, if it's related to your practice or, you know, building up your skills, that feels pretty, pretty solid for me. Uh, Tina says, what if you're doing this manually in Excel? Um, amazing, Tina. I love that. The way I do it, um, when we're sort of building sheets for somebody in Excel, we track the categories and then we basically say, this is where the categories match up on Schedule C. So you've got that little map. And then my favorite way to do it in Excel is you have one column that basically shows all of your income and expenses for the year. And then you have another column that basically says the tax number. And so if there are things that you're not deducting or taking like the 50% limitation on meals, that's where you can make that adjustment in that tax column. And yes, Keith, uh, you claim 50% of the costs of ordinary and necessary business meals. 
Someone, although I've forgotten who, asked the question about um, paying contractors earlier. This is that example. Um, this is a band. The most responsible member of the band is the money person. So they get $2,500 for a gig. That also probably means they're going to get a 1099 at the end of the year. Unless, as Christopher pointed out, um, they're just getting the cash. Maybe if they're splitting the take from the night, it's just cash. And maybe the venue isn't 1099ing them. But odds are they're going to 1099 them. This is taxable income to that main person. And then that main person pays the other three performers $625 each. What happens on Schedule C, I won't make you answer this in the interest of time, but this person shows income of $2,500. And then on the line that says contract labor, they would report a deduction of $1,875. That's the three people times $625 each. So what happens here is they have $2,500 of income, then $1,875 of expense, if that's all that happened during the year, they would have $625 of net income they would pay taxes on, just like these other members of the band. Also, because this person is now paying them more than $600, the main person has to send the bandmates 1099s. That deadline is January 31st, which is right around the corner. So if you paid other people more than $600 during 2023, you need to send them 1099s. Um, and Leandra says, is that the same as with paying grants? Yes, unless the grantor paid the other person directly. Um, usually though, the grant comes to you and then you pay the people. So you would have the 1099 responsibility to those people. If you're using QuickBooks or Wave or some of these other systems, they usually have some sort of 1099 reporting system baked into them, which is awesome. Check the price on it though. Um, if it's several hundred dollars and you only have to send like three 1099s, um, track1099.com is a great resource that will allow you to send 1099s electronically to other people. And I think it's like $2.15 or maybe $3.15 per 1099. Uh, Tina says, is the 600 threshold total or per gig? And it is the threshold for the entire year. So if you hired one person, you know, three times during the year for $225 each, uh, you are over that threshold um, for the whole year. And uh, Lucretia says, is there a way to do the 1099s online? Track1099.com is, in my opinion, the easiest and cleanest way to do it. You can do it through the IRS, but it's clunkier. Um, and, you know, this, this is a little bit easier. Amita says, uh, if it's $500 each for, and that's all you paid everyone for the course of the year, that would be below the 1099 threshold. Everyone still should be support, reporting their income because it is business income to them. But if you paid someone $500 during the year, that's under the 1099 threshold. So you would not have to send them a 1099. Christopher says, do you have to be a sole proprietor or a business to generate the 1099s? Nope. You just have to be actively conducting your business. Um, so, so that is all good. And Jessica loves track 1099. Yeah, I do too. I only send out like seven or eight 1099s each year. So that's what I do. Okay. I'm doing a quick time check. We are still in good shape. Um, this is the attire one. Um, the attire is, is a tough one. This artist bought a new outfit to wear to an artist talk and an opening where they got an award. A dancer has performance only shoes and a glass blower has some safety equipment. The question is what is deductible? And the answer is the dancer's performance shoes are deductible. The safety equipment are deductible attire, but the new outfit to wear is not deductible. The general rule when it comes to clothing is if you could wear it somewhere else, it is not deductible, right? So be careful when it comes to, to clothing. Uh, Amita has a follow-up about contract later. How does, how does that show on your taxes? So Amita, let's pretend you are the band member that gets the $2,500 and you pay the other people 
$500 each, there are three of them, you would still have $2,500 of income. Then you would have $1,500 of a deductible expense for contract labor. It's still contract labor, even if it's below the 1099 reporting threshold. And so then your net income would be $1,000. And then uh, Leandra asked the question, if the other person has a business and you paid the business, do you still need a 1099? The guidance isn't totally and completely clear on this. Um, I would say if they sent you an invoice, then you're on stronger ground to not send them a 1099, um, especially if they have an LLC or they are a formal business. Um, you could just sort of send it to be safe. Um, if you are going to decide not to send them one, though, I would probably document that in some way, like go through your accounting system, like run a profit and loss report that shows everyone you paid and then just show the people you're going to 1099. And then I would probably print it out and write not 1099-ing XYZ LLC because they sent me an invoice and they are an established business. So sort of show your thinking in case questions come up. Okay. Home office deduction is the last example we're going to get to get through. Um, and this is one that comes up and people have a lot of questions on it. So if you are running a business and you use a portion of your home for your business, there is a deduction to claim business use of your home. So in this example, the artist has a separate room of their house. They only use it as a studio and it is 100 square feet out of 1,000 square feet in total for the home. We would calculate this deduction by first calculating the business use percentage, right? So 100 square feet divided by 1,000 square feet is 10%. So then we would claim the deduction by calculating 10% of their rent or mortgage, 10% of their utilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we would calculate the deduction for business use of your home. I will say though, this is a deduction that gets a whole lot of scrutiny in part because there are very specific rules you have to comply with and most people don't comply with them. So the IRS knows that there are a lot of errors when it comes to claiming this deduction. It is also on its own line on Schedule C. So it's not sort of lumped in together with any other sort of studio rental costs, right? Business use of your home is its own separate line and calculation. Some of those specific rules include the space you use must be your principal place of business and you have to use it exclusively and regularly for your business purpose. And it is often this exclusive test that is the hard one to meet. You can also not have any other place where you conduct administrative tasks related to your business. So pretty high hurdles to clear if you are claiming this deduction. If you meet those rules, though, you are absolutely entitled to this deduction. But I would make sure to be very clear in how you are documenting sort of the space, how you're calculating everything, and then, of course, saving all of the sort of underlying evidence of all of the costs. Um, Leandra says, what about a business studio garage space? Totally fine. I would do it the same way, right? Assuming you're using the space exclusively and regularly for the business, you would just measure the space of the garage and then take that as a percentage of the overall home. Uh, Wendy asks about a detached building. Same thing. If it's an outbuilding or a barn or a detached garage or something like that, um, if it's part of the overall property, I would take the square feet of the outbuilding and then take it as a percentage of everything. Just make sure it's also included in your denominator as you're calculating that space. Um, the other thing I will draw your attention to is publication 587 is a really good one when it comes to business use of your home, because this is one that is going to get scrutinized. So you want to make sure you're being really clear about complying with this. 
In this example, what I was going to show you is that this writer, they're a poet, they write during the day, and then after school, their room is a playroom. There is no deduction for this space. Why? Because it's not exclusively used for their business activity. It's an office slash playroom, right? So be careful with that exclusive use. And then in this third example, this is a designer who has exclusive use, right? They have a dedicated space. They only use it for their design work, but their design work is as a W-2 employee of someone else. And remember, if you are a W-2 employee of someone else, no deduction for business expenses. I know that is a lot and it's super complex, um, but I am very glad we got through all of those other um, deduction examples. Um, I will say what other deductions are you curious about? If you have other questions, make sure they land in the chat. Here's why. We're going to do a follow-up video series and go through and answer all the questions we didn't get to. Um, and so you'll make sure, we'll make sure you get those answers that you need. Um, with that, I am aware that we are out of time. So keep typing those questions in as we go through this and we will make sure to get to all of the questions and push those answers out to you. And I will just end with gratitude. Thank you for existing in the world, doing all the good things you do. Thank you for your questions and your engagement. It is always so much fun leaning in with the South Arts community. You have some of the best questions and it's such a pleasure spending time with you. And thanks of course, again, to Jessica and the entire South Arts team for facilitating these conversations. Jessica posted a link to the survey. Make sure you do that before you exit out. And thank you again for all of the questions and the good info. Jessica, back to yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. That was awesome. Uh, I, I learn something new every year because I also have a W-2 and also get paid 1099. So I'm a mixed income uh, individual like a lot of us are in the arts. Um, as Elaine mentioned, and I'm going to drop it in the chat again, we do have a quick survey. It really does only take four minutes to get to or to complete. So I'm going to put that in the chat. Um, following this workshop so what's going to happen next um for those of you who registered um which is pretty much everybody i'm going to send out a link to the recording uh it lives on our website um if you didn't register don't worry you can just go to the professional development page on the south arts website we archive all of our, um, or as many as we can, um, with permission from the guests, um, facilitators, um, the information that they provide and includes uh, a recording of the session as well. Um, so within that follow-up email that I will send to you, there'll be that link plus the PowerPoint PDF um, presentation. And then also um, following um, uh, that, we'll send another email when the Q&A video is ready to distribute as well. So a um, couple of things coming up after this. And so if you could take just four minutes to answer the questions on that survey, um, what's really great about the survey is that we also ask about future things, future engagements that you would like to know more about and different kinds of classes that you would like to see South Arts present. So I use that information to help guide the content that we bring you every year. Thank you very much. Thank you again to Elaine. Thank you to everybody for carving out time in your day uh, and happy tax season. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>